Just over a year ago, the Sunday World newspaper published allegations that a senior DUP politician had a gay encounter at a Belfast hotel. That Stormont MLA was Paul Berry. Since then, he hasn't spoken publicly about those allegations, his family's reaction, his legal challenge over his party's threat to discipline him, and his subsequent resignation from the DUP. Tonight, though, Paul Berry speaks frankly to Insight. Looking back on it now, I, I was there, yes, and there's no use in trying to sort of dress it up. The massive impact emotionally, mentally, physically, I'm not homosexual. I made a massive error of judgment. I was foolish in being there. It actually did go through your head of saying, look, if I was to end all of this here, my family and close to me would obviously grieve, but at least it would be resolved. From a true red, white and blue family dedicated to the DUP, Paul Berry was the darling of the party. From the factory floor to the floor of the assembly, only 21 and already winning for them in South Armagh. Where do you think you are getting, Mr. Trimble, if you think the union saved? There was little doubt, though, that you made an impression. You know, who do you think you are, Mr. Trimble? And <laughs> there was something about Paul Berry, wasn't there? Well... I think the, the something that was there was obviously my age, that I was, I was young and it was at the time of the Belfast Agreement and everything obviously was at its height and there was that whole uh, song in relation to who do you think you're kidding Mr Trimble and all of that and you were hitting the headlines with that and there was issues like drum cree and things like that that had come up. That clearly was a challenge for you at such a young age, that you know, major challenge there that obviously you look back and say look, there was a lot of learning, you know, curves that, and things that you had to experience along the way that matured you as, as you went along the way. But the strong unionist line found favour in the party. He rose as it did. Little, it seemed, could go wrong. Sunday World uh, lands on your doorstep or you're made aware of it. What did you interpret it as saying? It was a Saturday morning about half nine and the doorbell went and uh, I was door doorstepped as it's called and it was called by a reporter and obviously went through the whole thing. I actually invited him into the house and uh, obviously discussed and then he went and I looked upon it, right, this is for complete destruction of me politically in the following week. This was a Saturday and Thursday was the election. And uh, I knew at that stage that this was to completely destroy me politically. And no words could describe how myself and my wife and family felt, because clearly when it happened then we had to call them round and explain exactly what had happened and what was going to happen possibly the next day. And that had a massive impact emotionally, mentally, physically on me personally, but especially my wife and family. And tell me the allegation as you perceived it. The allegation was clearly that you were gay, that uh, basically with this individual being gay, that uh, he's part of the DUP, he's part of the Free Presbyterian Church. I was labelled as a preacher, which I'm not, and that uh, clearly this goes against the teachings of the Free Presbyterian Church and the DUP and all affiliated to it. But nonetheless, central core aspects, certain core aspects of the allegations were true. You were in that hotel room. Well, when the reporter came to the door, I said, yes, I was there. Uh, some people advised me that I shouldn't have spoke at all. I should have closed the door and said, look, you'll see my lawyer. But I didn't do that. And looking back on it now, I, I was there, yes. And there's no use in trying to sort of dress it up. I made a massive error of judgment. I was foolish in being there. I was foolish in allowing myself to get set up in that way. And that is something that I will live to the day I die. Because I look around on the pain and the hurt that it caused. Why were you there? Well, 
goes back to the whole core issue where you start asking questions and you say, well, why did God allow this to happen? You can't blame God. No. In, in, in this. I mean, it's, it's no, why you never blamed him. No, but why were you there? Well, you, you, you're there on the basis that, frankly, at a time when you should have been walking close to God, you were not, and I'm not blaming him, because I was going to explain that. At a time when you should have been walking close to God, and obviously you were seen as a, a Christian, and I let politics take sort of control. And over a period of a year, year and a half, you were really letting it take control. And your walk with God wasn't the same. And you were getting into bed at night and maybe reading a bit of daily bread and that was it, and thrown on the side. Maybe that tired, you wouldn't even been praying. And God seen that. And he, I honestly, believe, I know now within myself, because I have had a year to reflect and have gone through all of that. And I believe, obviously, it, he allowed that to happen. There are times you go back and you ask the question, but why this way? You know, I'm, I'm not gay and all of what you could be labelled with. But someday you will understand that. And, you, you know, I've learned through the scripture during that period of time that those whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And I looked upon that as a chastening from God because really he, he looked upon me and said, he's not reading the Bible. He's not praying the way he should be. Are you accepting that he was tempting you in your terms with a, with a homosexual encounter? No, no, because I'm not homosexual. You know, and for that to be tempted of that nature, you know, he couldn't have done that. But he did bring me to a point of something so serious where he brought me to a point in my life to say, hold on. And it's not up to me to decide how I go through that trial or how I face that affliction. He will decide that. What was the context of that hotel room a potential homosexual encounter? Well, that's what was suggested, that you know, that I had sex with a male, which was not the case. But clearly that's what has been betrayed. And only time, you know, obviously will resolve that. And but is it true that the extent or the prospect or the atmosphere or, or anything that attached in those four walls was of a homosexual nature? Well, certainly, you know, one who would be homosexual would be one that would want to have another sort of close sexual relationship with that person. And certainly that did not happen. Uh, so therefore that was not the case. You know, and I think that's the thing that obviously annoys you that, you know, you've been labelled with that. And obviously it annoys your wife even more because you've been labelled with that. And that's the thing that has hurt her the most. You know, the fact that she knows that I'm not. But the fact that you've been labelled with that and is trying to overcome that. You know, but I don't blame anybody but myself for the mess that I got myself into. Are you saying in any way that there was, a, there was an apple here, there was a temptation put in front of you and you nearly accepted it? Yes, probably there was a stage where obviously you weren't even thinking straight. You had so much pressure upon you at, at the time of an election. However, the whole homosexual part of it certainly untrue. Though the Sunday world remains convinced of its case. The paper also alluded to texts that suggest it would be suggestive of something more than a massage for a sports injury. Do you accept that those texts went to and fro? Well obviously because there's still an ongoing legal issue you know uh, that is all with sort of my legal team. There's things that I can say and there's things that I can't say one day hopefully I will be able to say. But in a case like that, you know, clearly there were things that happened that should not have happened. There were things that were done that should not have been done, and I should not have been there. But won't some people view you, if you don't take the full rigors of the law available to you against those that have made this allegation, that that's a sign of weakness, potentially that there's some truth attached to what those people claim? Yes, but people will, will say whatever they want anyhow and people will come to a conclusion whatever they want. What I have to decide on for myself, my wife and my family is what is the best course of action for us because at the end of the day when I go home at night and close the door uh, people who want to come to conclusions are not there with us. We have to get on with our life and our family and uh, that has to be done. And what's it like as, uh, as a husband with your wife doubting you? Well, because there's that love there 
you know, clearly within marriage there has to be that love. And I always acknowledged that it was not easy for Lorna. Lorna very easily could have jumped into the car and said, right, that's it, I'm away, cheerio. But she didn't, she stood, she stood by me. And it was very, very difficult, massively difficult for her, you know, to be brought into such a spotlight. You like that music, Paul? I do, I. <laughs> you were a gospel singer, weren't you? Or you? Do you still sing? Not really as much now, you know, because it, it would take up a lot of your time, too. But uh, obviously, with everything that has happened, it has been a difficult year, so you just sort of basically pull back from everything and sort of try to get your life and your family and stuff back to normality. Focus on the core? Yes, exactly, because I think when something like that happens, it is the core that stays with you. And, uh, you know, you even listen to that song, Do Thy Friends Despise Forsake Thee. You know, in many cases, I could point to that and say, well, yes, people who once were my friends obviously have forsaken me because of various reasons and things that has happened. And you can really relate to songs like that. And when you get back to the core, it's really your family that have supported you. So therefore, they're the people that deserve the time. and the attention. The paper article appeared, immediate fallout. What happened that Sunday? Well, that Sunday I was asked to go to a meeting uh, at Dr. Paisley's home in the afternoon with the party officers to see what needs to be done or what can be done. And uh, that meeting took place Quite a number of the senior officers were there with the party's uh, legal representative. But at that time, because of the sort of mental exhaustion it had on me and the pressure it had, I was in the meeting, but I wasn't really there, if you know what I mean, because everything was going through your head and your wife was at home. Obviously, family and friends was there, but you were in a different world. and. You were obviously meeting the people who clearly had to make decisions of what was happening that week. And really, I was advised at that stage, look, get a lawyer and get them to respond on this issue. And you're going to have to do that within the time scale of the week before this election to be seen that you're, that you're doing something. And I left that meeting. Uh, Dr. Paisley was, was very kind and obviously very concerned about more so my wife and, and family. The bottom line was, look, you know, that you've got yourself into it, basically, so get out of it, you know, and it was left very much on my doorstep that you've got yourself into that, you've got now to get yourself out of it. And I can understand where they were coming from because it was a week, less than a week, until the main Westminster elections. It was a vital time for them. And, you know, I had to bear that in mind as well. But... In the background, I was also concerned that everything was happening that fast, that mentally I wasn't, and mostly I wasn't fit to cope with it. But nonetheless, he brazened it out. I have absolutely no comment to make on that, and if anybody has a comment to make on that, they'll be dealing with my lawyers immediately. Do you think it will affect your vote? What will affect my vote? The allegations that were published in the I paper. have told you, you could end up with my lawyer if you continue to press those issues. How the last few days I feel you. wonderful. Thank you very much. And the thing that was going through my mind, and indeed others' minds, you know, because of what has happened here to Paul, will this affect the upper band chance for Westminster? Will it affect the new inner Armagh vote where it'll bring the DUP down into second place again within unionism? But the party vote wasn't materially affected. In fact, it won nine Westminster seats. So the problems it worried about were over. But they were only beginning for Paul Berry, summoned before the DUP hierarchy. There was one stage, there was about 15 in the room, and it was very intimidating, and it was very, very stressful mentally, because I was on one side of the table, and there was 15 sitting on the other side of the table, and I felt that on level it was very, very unfair, because you were going through a very difficult experience in your life, 
and to have to look across the table at 12 to 15 people to me just wasn't the most appropriate way to do it and it got to one stage where I said look I am going to have to go to a smaller meeting here where there's going to have to be less personnel at it because of the mental strain because all eyes was on you and all with the thumb down and all with the thumb down you know uh, yes we're concerned about you and yes you know we wish you well but you know clearly something's going to have to be done here there was really no charges at that time because it was obviously up to the disciplinary committee to to inform me of that but really what they were saying is look this is the process that it's going to take I, and we'll suspend you but it will be done privately I, for the sake of your family and all of that and I said thank you that's okay I understand that I accept that and I left the meeting that day thinking right that's okay if I'm going to be suspended in the near future at least it's done privately that no one will know about it and I I actually was at a site meeting a few days after it and a reporter from another news agency had phoned me and had said look I believe you've been suspended that there's a disciplinary committee set up and it probably could lead to your expulsion within the party there's been assembly group meetings held and you have not been invited to and I said look who has informed you of this well he says a very senior source within the party it's very good information that we have received and has always been reliable and actually wasn't bitter about it but it did cause me concern because I felt well, look there is somebody clearly here working inside to ensure that I go and there's somebody here who knew about this at a senior level that was prepared to tip off the press and uh, not to basically show how wonderful they are and this is a bit of inside information it really was a message directed to me that look you're going to have to go but Paul Berry said no refusing to go he launched a legal challenge over the DUP's disciplinary procedures and won his injunction I can honestly say when the solicitor phoned me to tell me that that my wife and I and family were not jumping up and down thinking this is great we've won the injunction we've got one against them it might have been betrayed like that, but that was not the nature because of our long-term relationship with the party and with the leader that we felt that it was the most unfortunate road to go down. And then this uh, bowl here was uh, bought uh, glass lock mm -hmm. just across the border there. It was a porridge bowl, Prince William's porridge bowl. <laughs> <laughs> so. I haven't eaten out of it yet. Is that 165 euro? It is, yes, but it wasn't bought for that, I can assure you. So you just leave the label lying <laughs> around? Just leave the label, it looks good. <laughs> There's little doubt that you're a royalist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what would make you say that? She's everywhere here. In the end, Paul Berry withdrew his legal challenge, paying some costs to the party, and resigned. The suspended DUP Assembly member Paul Berry has quit the party. The announcement came at the High Court as the politician dropped legal action against his party leaders, including the Reverend Ian Paisley. The party regrets that this action was ever commenced in the first place. The effect of the legal challenge he feels perhaps worse than the original allegations, and not just on him, but on his family as well. His father, a long-term chair of his local DUP branch, not re-elected. It came to the proposal for a chair, there was a massive silence and then somebody else was proposed and he wasn't even proposed and I think it was the fact that he wasn't even proposed I think that he was more hurt by because of the 35 years he had put into the party. My view of that was well look it was me that took the party to court and my family shouldn't suffer as a result of that as a result of decisions that I make but that's what was happening and that's the human nature as well, that's the ugly side of it. That one day you have friends and the next you have enemies. Shunned? Shunned, yes. Uh, I, uh, no hesitation in saying that, shunned by people. Uh, sadly by professing Christians who obviously at the time was there for us but because of the legal action the religious aspect removed itself from it and the political aspect came in and then as a result of that and I was shown by many people. In fact, it got to a stage 
numbers even that were in my mobile phone for a number of years. I just took them out because they weren't phoning anymore and they probably wouldn't speak to you anyway. So it, it, it got as low as that. So low, he contemplated suicide. There were times when it actually did go through your head of saying, look, if I was to end all of this here, my family and close to me would obviously grieve, but at least it would be resolved. And I think when you get to that stage, you're in a very, very serious situation. And it was only with, obviously, the help of my wife and the grace of God that got you through, because amazingly there were times when you were thinking like that, that something just would have happened just to lift you up. Maybe somebody would have sent you a card or a letter or something of that nature that would have just said, hold on, there's more to life than thinking of this. And you contemplated it to the level of the practicalities of it? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, very. Oh, I had it down to, you know, the fine art of saying, right, well, look, okay, you know, you're even contemplating, I have a will made, you know, one should I do that? But then if I do that, my solicitor will say, hold on, he's going to do something stupid here. So you even things that got in your mind, you know, and said, you know, don't. His resignation left him as an independent. New circumstances, new office at Stormont, separate from his former DEP colleagues. You'll be even on a different side of the chamber, which will be quite unusual. Oh, it is, of course, that's right. You'll be on the other side I'll of the on, chamber. I'll be on the enemy's side. <laughs> I'll be infiltrating the enemy, but uh, I'll be on the enemy's side as, as such. But it, it doesn't really worry me to a certain extent, as long as I know that when I go in on Monday, I know where I'm sitting, and I'm not just walking into the chamber and saying, right, where am I going here? At least I know that, that everything's going according to plan. So here we are, it's been some time since you were here, the odd meeting, but how are you feeling right now? I'm not feeling actually too bad because I said, yes, yeah, nervous, but it's one of those things that you just have to do, you know, have to go up and register. And this time I'll be registering as a unionist rather than affiliated to a particular party. With the resignation came issues like this here that you have to go but you were there as an independent and you were on your own, but it's one of those things that have to be done. So here we are. This is the house on the hill and all the media. I invite the independent unionist member, Mr. Paul Berry, to come forward to sign the role of membership. I've emerged a lot stronger, maybe not politically, but emotionally, spiritually, I, mentally. I, I feel I'm a stronger person, and I'm not saying that boasting, because I have come through so much and I've had to deal with so much. If I would not have had this experience, I probably would have been a lot weaker individual and of a weaker character. Now, I'm not saying that somebody <laughs> was out to make a stronger character that they're going to have to get into a time of trial and tribulation. But in life, you're not always on the mountain. Don't you be going far. Stay you here with me. Come on. I always believe that no matter who you are in life or wherever you are in life, you will face a problem and you will face a time of trial and testing. And it all depends how you actually approach that. And there's two things you can do, and there's two clearly options that were there in front of me. One, I lie down, let it beat me, and die. Or I actually face up to the issue, face up to the problem, and try to move forward for everyone, and to get your life back together again. <laughs>